professional theater company that did avant-garde theater, and the artistic director continually brought in puppets and masks from Indonesia. So when my first sabbatical came up, I decided that's where I was going to go, to Indonesia. I spent time in Java and in Bali, and there I was studying mask dance traditions and learning how to dance and train myself, and I really felt that it was going to be a way to help train my actors here at Holy Cross how to use their bodies more effectively. Lynn and the Bandams really introduced us to Balinese culture by being in Shackled Spears. Most of my interaction with the Balinese professors has been working on shows when they've been helping with shows. We've had a, a program in, in Balinese music and dance here since 1998, so I've had these different faculty members from Bali that I've worked directly with on, on their program here. We have Balinese artists in residence every semester teaching our students. It's a very special program. I'm always amazed at the performances when I see students, our, our acting students, doing the Balinese dancing because it really brings out a whole other aspect to their physical work and, and the way the, just all of the things that they can do with their bodies. We had Pak Wayanta, who is quite a distinguished artist in Bali, designing the set. And I wanted to um, take some of his artwork and put it in the costumes. Wayanta and the Bondams were involved in all of those aspects, and they would, you know, give their opinions on what they thought was working well in the scene, both lightwise and setwise, and how everything. So it was a really ended up being a very collaborative process, a very um, complete conversation with all, all parties. I've been a long time admirer of the work of Mahdi Wianta, especially his large-scale installations, and I was thrilled when the Bondum suggested that we might actually think about a collaboration together. I had two characters or two actors who wore light colors and I used Pak Wianta's um, artwork, some of his artwork. I actually painted it and um, sort of um, applicate it onto the costumes so that I could bring his artwork into that part of it as well. I could go on for days about the artwork in Wianta's house and the giant exhibit that he created out of the pictures of our shows here with pieces coming out of it and like stuck up on, on a log and all of the amazing artwork that was in his house. The students were very involved in the collaboration and development of the piece and really had ownership in the whole process. Then we performed in April of 2012. We got a great review in the Jakarta Post and that triggered an invitation to attend the 35th Bali Arts Festival. There was screaming, there was jumping up and down, and we ran from class into Lynn's office, blew open the door, and screamed, we're going to Bali. Sounded like a great opportunity. Needless to say, I was ecstatic, not belief. It's something that everybody who'd been in the Chuckle Spirits and who had taken Balinese dance or you know, had gotten a little taste of that culture has dreamed about. One of the things I was curious about going to Bali is what made the Balinese style of performance special as opposed to Western performance. The best piece of advice the could gave me was not to have any expectations when you're going abroad. Well, yeah, being in Balinese dance and actually, like, you know, interacting with the Bondums a lot helped me show a little bit of the culture beforehand and even the food when Swasti would cook for us, so I was a little bit prepared for that. The only things I had to go on about what to expect were what I knew in America and from what Lynn had explained to us prior to going. So, so going into it, it was trying to balance out uh, the amazingly positive, this is going to change your life, this is going to be an amazing experience, oh my gosh, do this while you're young, this is going to be great, <laughs> and like, again, watch out for scorpions that might crawl into your shoes. I was 
excited, first of all, because I had never been out of the country before. So just to get the opportunity to leave the U.S. was uh, a, a great thing for me to hear. And it's just so far away and so... It's on the other side of the world. Uh, that it was almost too good to be true. Definitely a lot of anxiety trying to prepare to move halfway across the world. I was extremely leery of touring this show. I had visions of horrible things happening. All kinds of horrible things happening, technically speaking. Traveling with any show um, is difficult and s scary because you're always wondering whether I'm traveling to Indonesia or I'm traveling to New York is do I have everything with me? Did I get everything? Did I forget anything? Being around Holy Cross, you get a lot about what the art of Bali is and what the culture of Bali is, but I never really knew that much about where this art came from, where this culture that we saw here at Holy Cross came from. And then we had this opportunity to go and it was, it was awesome. Whenever I got super frustrated, or super upset, or super whatever, or any of my friends, really. I'd say, okay guys, it's fine, because we're going to Bali. One of the things that I loved about uh, the parade and, and that whole day, because that whole day was just incredible, was understanding or beginning to understand how much the arts meant to that culture and being so appreciative and blown away by it and it just to see how passionate people were about it and it's really an incredible feeling to be a part of. I'm pretty sure at some point during the opening ceremonies, whether it was during the parade or during the opening performance, I turned to Adia and said, we're at the Olympics. We're at the Balinese version of the Olympics. Of the Olympics. Opening ceremony. The opening ceremony, seeing all of the important people, being closer to the president than we have been to the American president or anyone important in America. Yeah. And it was just kind of awe-inspiring, the amount of the beautiful lighting and all of the buildings and all of the costumes and colors and festivities. It was just kind of overwhelming, but in an absolutely amazing way. And essentially, this thing is like the Olympics for them. So when they come out, they're representing their country to their fullest extent. Every single costume piece symbolized something in their dance or, or like it represented something that was part of their culture or part of the story that they were performing. <laughs> As they were performing, it began to rain. At first it was like slight drizzling, but then it became like a very heavy downpour. And as this was happening, these performers going on. They acted as if nothing was bothering them, as if the sun was out, and as if the audience was still full. Meanwhile, you see tons of people try to run and escape from the rain, but 
nothing phased them. And I, I found that absolutely intriguing, awe-inspiring to be able to keep that focus in that situation and to perform to the extent that they were able to. There's the language barrier, for one thing. So you're, you're automatically being more physical, trying to communicate with everybody. And then on the other hand, they are so physical with their art and what they do. So they're doing all this crazy physical stuff in rehearsal that's just like absurdly awesome. And so I know for me, it's been sort of like, oh, okay, I need to step up my game physically. So I think that um, that's probably the biggest change so far. And it shows you, like, it doesn't really matter about the language barrier. Like, it was kind of like a universal thing. When I finally got down to it and realized that Bali is, is very different from the United States, but it's not technically ignorant. Um, they have computers there. They have sound systems. They do, you know, they, they have that stuff. And so they know what it is. Um, and in fact, the lighting system that they have at the Kasiranawa Theater is more elaborate than what we have here. So they really have moved forward, and that was when I was there before, they didn't have any of that in, in that theater. Their style of performance is much different from what we learn here at Holy Cross. So being able to modify my performance in order to be able to do some of the new things that we added to the show was something that really surprised me. When you give someone a brand new character that they can like mold and play with, I think it was a little scary for them at first, but it was really cool seeing them like just, you know, take it and own it at the end because everyone loved it. I remember watching Yoman in occupational therapy moving the wheelbarrow around and it was just almost instantaneous. It felt, it looked like there was like 200 pounds in the wheelbarrow, but there was nothing in it. Seeing the way that they develop characters through their body and not through beats objectives vocally, they still construct characters that are completely fully formed, but they aren't verbal. The Balinese rely a lot on spirituality and physicality. Their development from the characters starts with physicality. And ours always starts with, oh, here are your scripts, here are the lines, here are the words. For them, it's all about who is this person, how they move. What does that movement mean? During one of the uh, rehearsals we got to see, one of our cast members uh, had to be angry and then sad. And you got from the moment he, he stepped out onto the stage that not only was he pissed as all hell, he also was the villain. He also had a love interest. They just kind of feel it and then they do it. They don't really think. I don't know, it was almost amazing watching, you know, the cast members almost goof around with us backstage and then when we tell them it's time to go on, they just turn around and boom, they're all there. And they're totally committed and into it and I'm just like, how can I do that? <laughs> I can't do that. It was really interesting how like when we were there, they said, um, like the people in the audience asked, um, like all of us, how did how did they how were they able to do what they did on stage? Like all the Balinese actors, and we were like, how could we do that? Like what they do. So it's just very interesting to see like how different it is, and like um, how we both collaborated together and both put on something really cool. <laughs> None of them are really actors per se, they're more closer to dancers, but in dance it involves some acting. I think um, it was the scene for Trance with Rhonda, and um, just looking at how David did it then and how Gus, um, which is one of the actors, did it now, was just like night and day. Just to see someone who's from that culture and to perform that dance and do it that enthusiastically was, was a sight to see. <laughs> We have counts for everything. You know, you're listening to music, you know, one, two, three, four, turn five, six, seven, eight, pose, two, three, four, and, and that's how we do it. And so it was really funny learning some of the songs and having them just know when to go and they didn't give you a count. 
But what's the count? We they need just, to know the count. They just feel what's the, the count music. for us? Yeah, they just they just feel the music and have it so ingrained in their souls that there's a completely different way of learning choreography um, and working with the ballerine. Um, and, and Who for, count things differently anyway? But that was definitely another uh, thing that we as American performers had to get had to get used to. They really brought a press a positive energy into the production, and once you have that type of environment where half of the group is always on point in how they're performing and in their attitude, it just makes your job easier. You want to go in and you want to put forth the extra effort because you see other people doing it as well. They were so much fun backstage and like never like really nervous, but like when they needed to get serious, they got serious like that. Originally in the show, I'm, I'm one of the bed dance dancers and I did the dance with Christian. And it was really easy to act with him. And when I found out that I was going to have to do this very strangely personal dance with a Balinese person, I kind of freaked out a little. And I'm really ashamed to say that, but I did. And then I got paired with Gade. Mm -hmm. And Gade is absolutely adorable. So sweet and cannot speak English. There was a point when he was talking to me and I did not understand a word that he was saying because he was saying it all in Bahasa. But I knew exactly what he meant and exactly what he was saying, not the words themselves, but the sentiments behind it. And that was the coolest thing in the world to me. But I'm glad I'm here because I've met you. There were times where I would be dancing with Lucia and Lucia and I had uh, a good number of silent communication things that could get us laughing or it goes, okay, now here's the timing for this, here's the timing for that. Um, and then my, my favorite experience, I think, from Bali was learning how to um, do one of the traditional Balinese dances from one of the Balinese dancers in the traditional way. And the traditional way to learn is to have the person go behind you, so they will lovingly like hit up your, your arm if you're being lazy and you're trying putting it down like this, and to, to, they all, um, all the Balinese people kind of participate in that. So they will all be, oh, you know, here you have to shake your head, here, you know, no, like, you know, chest up, chest up, and, and oh, you know, spread your legs wider and squat, and it was fantastic, because I'd only ever read about that process. I'm gonna remember this forever. Actually, it was um, a conversation I had with Nyoman. I know putting the flowers behind your uh, ears, like a part of the ceremony and it's significant, but I always wondered how it stays there. And he was like, um, if you have strong faith, it's the power of God. And that's when he asked me what my religion was, and I said it was Catholic, and he's like, oh, so it's the same thing. The structure for Shackled Spirits came from our weekly visits to Bangli Hospital where we watched patients doing work therapy, music therapy, physical therapy, art therapy, and that became a rough construct for how we were going to shape the show. These costumes were pieces of clothing that I took and cut up and put them back together indiscriminately. So there were upside down pockets and pockets sideways and zippers on shoulders and so everything was put together in the wrong way. So the statement for me was that people go into an institution like that, whether it's a, a mental institution or a jail or any place where somebody's confined like that and being treated, that the treatment is sometimes indiscriminate and so people get sort of taken, broken down, and then they use medication or therapy or whatever to put them back together, and sometimes they're not put to get back together in a, a good way or a right way. They're just sort of weird. Throughout history and across cultures, mm -hmm. mental illness is something that is pushed under the rug. What Shackle does, and pretty remarkably, is shows us that this is not something that we can ignore. This show 
calls attention to something that people really don't want to talk about and show that it really is a problem and that it needs to be at least discussed. One of my favorite lines from the show is, hearing voices is about as common as being left-handed. Sometimes people say it's from nature that you know you're just born crazy and some people say it's from nurture and it just makes you think like what drove these people to be like you know in or what is considered insane and you know the character of the writer is also questioning like what gives the doctors the right to like you know sort of label these people as being insane and it's also like maybe if we understood their story more and like took the time to get to know these people and really understand what drove them to do what they did I researched Balinese culture by reading a book by psychiatrist and psychologist Dr. Suryani and Dr. Jensen called Transcend Possession in Bali. And it truly opened my eyes to the power of trance and possession in our world. This possession is so powerful and it can be used to understand the type of experiences that and itu biasanya terjadi pada saat uh, yang ada upacara namanya menjaya jaya itu ya, ya, ya. seperti upacara uh, nunas taksu pada saat uh, suatu festival sebelum festival diadakan uh, kita kita di grup tari atau di grup seni yang akan mewakili suatu pertunjukan itu uh, selalu mengadakan uh, menjaya jaya atau nunas taksu nah, di situ biasanya uh, saya dan beberapa teman yang 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 mempunyai uh, apa riwayat trans ini uh, biasanya mengalami trans tersebut dan itu terjadi pada saat selesainya uh, upacara menjaya jaya tersebut. Nah selain itu uh, trans yang saya alami juga biasanya uh, terjadi setelah pertunjukan itu selesai gitu. Uh, ada uh, beberapa temen atau beberapa orang yang juga mengalami hal tersebut dan itu biasanya berantai misalnya satu orang sudah mengalami trans orang yang 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 mendapat riwayat atau biasa trans juga akan mendapat pengaruh dari uh, trans trans yang dilakukan oleh pada saat trans biasanya pikiran kita tuh merasa kosong ataupun kita merasa berat sekali 